Hi, this is Tom Kessler. Uh, this is my lecture on leadership. Um, I've given this lecture many times over the past 35 years. Uh, it's evolved in many ways, but I hope that you enjoy the leadership lecture. Uh, I cover uh, most of the major theories. Uh, I'm going to try to go through this as quickly as possible so that the lecture is not too long and so that uh, the logistics of uploading it to YouTube are reasonably efficient. Before I talk about the theories of leadership, uh, it's important to understand that their uh, leadership is one half of the equation, and the other half of the equation is followership. And because leaders have to lead, and they have to lead the followers to do the things that need to be done. So uh, we need to talk a little bit about personality and personality types, so that when we get into the theories, then you can sort of know, based on understanding your own personality, uh, what uh, you know, what your preferences are in terms of leaderships, and what kind of leader you probably are. So quickly, we'll talk about uh, some basic um, psychological uh, profiling. Uh, and please don't roll your eyes when you you hear this. You've probably heard it before. Uh, there's uh, a, a body of knowledge about uh, basic you know, personality types including the uh, Kiersey Bates uh, temperament test. And that's what uh, this slide is based on. Um, when we uh, take this test, and the test is available at no cost online, um, we measure, uh, based on answering a lot of questions, uh, we measure four different uh, characteristics of our preferences. Now, the best way to get your actual, um, your actual preference, you can hear my cat meowing in the background, because uh, they have the door closed. Uh, you, and so you get four different dimensions of, of, of your preference. Now, the preference, uh, people will say, well, sometimes I'm this preference and sometimes that preference. Um, but I'm really looking for your core preference when you're at rest. So I always say uh, when you take this test, you have to take it like you're sitting in a lounge chair, you're at home, there's no pressure, no stress, no children, um, and everything is relaxed. What are your general preferences? So that's the kind of preference we're seeking for because that's your natural preference. And when we talk about the four dimensions of preference that come from the Kiersey Bates test, the uh, temperament test, um, we uh, have four continua. And you can be any place across this continua. And over time, you can evolve and change uh, based on this, your location on this continua. And so we'll talk about that as well. So the first of the four continua is, is called introversion versus extroversion. And if you tend to be, uh, your number tends to be uh, a high introvert, uh, generally, that suggests or indicates that uh, you get energy when you're by yourself, and when you're with people, your energy gets drained from you. So high introvert uh, would be in that, that, that end of the continuum. High extrovert, on the other hand, is the opposite. And if they have to do tedious tasks that uh, require studying paper and being by themselves, their energy gets drained, and they need to talk to some people to have the energy put up. And then, of course, uh, a lot of you may take the test and get a score that's in the middle of introversion and extroversion. So it's a continua from high introvert to neutral to strong extrovert. Second one is sensing versus intuition. Uh, and people who get a high sensing score say, ah, oh, that's not right because I have intuition. But uh, you know, the, the word intuition may not be the best word here. Um, but it really has to do with how organized you are and how you process information. Uh, a sensing person is very structured, very organized, very ordered, uh, likes to have things in sequence, likes to know what the first step is and the second step. And the third step, they like to uh, have things uh, uh, well, well planned and well structured. Uh, the, and that's the high S side of the, uh, of the continuum. A high intuitive person, uh, the high end person, uh, organizes things uh, not very much. Uh, and they sort of uh, try to uh, uh, see the world or process information through intuition and gut feel. And they're not very planned and not very organized. And so a high intuitive person uh, has some positive uh, characteristics or aspects because they tend to be able to see gray. They tend, tend to be able to uh, adapt and adjust when things uh, aren't organized and aren't structured. Um, but they uh, tend to not be as organized and, and not process, process information in a serial manner. Well, you could be in the middle. You could have some sensing traits and some, some, some end traits, some intuitive traits. 
the thinking feeling is the third place on the continuum, and this is how you make your decisions or your facts. Um, a key high thinker uh, does a lot of analytical stuff, uh, and they make their decisions really based on the facts versus worrying about what people might feel. Uh, a high uh, feeler, uh, which, uh, which we can talk about in a bit, um, it makes their decisions based on their empathy situation, their feelings or reactions about how people might react to what they do or what decision they make. And then, of course, you could be in the middle. You could have a balance between uh, making decisions based on facts and making decisions based on empathy. And then finally, uh, the uh, last continuum, which is a very important one, is uh, uh, on the left side is a very judgmental person, highly judgmental, strongly judgmental, means you have opinions immediately uh, and that you reach conclusions quickly and that you make decisions rapidly. And sometimes uh, being a high judgmental person has its drawbacks because you make opinions or decisions before you uh, have all the facts uh, versus the perceiver on the far right hand side. Uh, they tend to uh, take forever or for a long time to make decisions because they're processing and collecting information and they want to have all the information before they make the decision. So on the left hand side, judgmental person, quick to judgment, quick to opinion. Right hand side, extremely slow to judgment, extremely slow to opinion, extremely slow in terms of making decisions. Or you could be in the middle. And so recognize that all these uh, have these extremes and then midpoints. And uh, you might be saying, ah, you know, I'm probably in the middle of all these. Well, if you take the test, the, uh, the temperament test online uh, that's free, uh, you'll probably find that you're not in the middle of a lot of these. Uh, I know, for example, in my case, and I won't tell you my letters, but for my letters, I'm strongly in, on one side or the other on every one of these four continuum. Um, and so uh, these preferences are extremely important, especially in the workplace, uh, especially in terms of leadership, in terms of followership. Now, uh, the way you saw before gets kind of complicated because in reality you have 16 different sets of letters. And so when you look online and you look at the different set of letters that come with each person, it does talk about their leadership style, um, but it's pretty complex. Well, I tried to boil this down into two categories, and, and I generally find uh, that where your letters uh, live on that uh, previous page, if you tend to be more sensing, uh, organized and structured, and more judgmental, uh, you tend to fit the category in the slide called the methodical preferences. Uh, what you like is you like a clear mission. You like to understand the logic of the mission. You don't want to just be told to do something without understanding why. Uh, you like to finish what you start. You like you need, have a strong need for a closure. You like detailed plans. Um, uh, my wife and I are getting ready to go to uh, um, Tuscany, uh, Italy, uh, uh, over a year from now, <clears throat> and we're going with two friends who are very structured, very methodical. They've already. Uh, got every uh, day planned out for the year from now. Uh, my friend that's going with us, he likes to pack like three months before he leaves, and I generally pack the night before I leave. Uh, he likes the de people like uh, who are methodical like to know the details. Uh, they're very uh, concerned about the format. If uh, there's a typed letter in a the slide, they'll be obsessed about the mistyped letter rather than um, the content. Uh, they tend to like tradition, respect tradition. They like formal procedures order, and they're very good at making uh, changes um, at, the, uh, at the, the micro level, uh, small changes, uh, fixing things that need to be fixed. Conceptual preference, if, the, the, if you fall more on the right-hand side, if your second letter is more uh, of intuitive and you're more of a uh, perceiver or you're somewhere in the middle on that scale, you're more likely to like things uh, that fit under this conceptual side. Uh, you, you think the mission is intuitively obvious. On the left-hand side, the methodical folks, if the boss doesn't tell this, the people what the mission is, they say, we don't know what the mission is. If you're on the right-hand side uh, and, and your boss doesn't say what the mission is, uh, you can sort of like know what the mission is intuitively and don't need to be told what it is. That creates problems in leadership scholarship. Uh, you tend to prefer concepts in, in a big way and images. Uh, you tend to be more of a visual thinker. You like to plan as you go. You, you do some things and see what happened, and you go some more and see what happened. You tend to pack the night before you leave on the trip. Uh, you're attracted to new things. You're not hung up about closure. Uh, you're uh, more easily bored when it gets a lot of detail. Um, you think that tradition is fairly boring and, and not useful, and the procedures uh, 
this says they're a waste of time. That may not be exactly true, but that procedures are, are just a thing to keep everybody uh, on the same path. And so these are very different ways of seeing the world and very different preferences. And uh, I won't get into all the details because I don't have a lot of time on this lecture. Um, but I could really uh, point out, uh, say, for example, in a marriage, if one person is extremely methodical and structured and organized, and the other person is conceptual, uh, you can have a lot of conflict in a marriage situation. And sometimes I tell long stories, and it's very funny. Uh, so uh, in terms of work structure, uh, high-performance people, the methodical people, uh, want a clear mission, meaningful work, work structure so they can finish projects because they need closure, and they want to obtain a sense of satisfaction. They also need to feel appreciated for their work. Um, as uh, organizations have embraced technology and shifted many tasks to the analysts, um, support personnel have less to do. I don't know why I'm saying that. Consequences of these high-performance employees feel underappreciated. Uh, let me restate that a little bit. Uh, the, uh, the methodical person who values tradition and the work that they do, they get their sense of self-esteem from the very work that they, that, that they do. They love being an outstanding police officer uh, or being a very respected military uh, officer or, or enlisted. Um, on the other side, uh, self-esteem doesn't come from the work, it comes from how many new things a person can get into in their lifetime. And as a result of that, they very often don't finish a lot of, a lot of things because they say, hey, here's something more interesting. I'm going to not do that anymore. I'm going to move on to something else. And so this idea of uh, these temperamental differences is extremely important. Um, now, in terms of leadership, you know, how can we translate this into leadership? Well, if a uh, conceptual person on the right-hand side uh, manages a group of conceptual people, uh, we generally uh, have a group that's good with ideas, but not very good about getting things done. It's a, it's a group that tends to wander all over the place. Uh, if we have uh, number two, we have the conceptual, the, uh, the, the intuitive person leading a group of methodical people, and the conceptual person never says what the mission is because they assume everyone knows it. It's the like me syndrome. The methodicals get very frustrated because they say, you know, we don't know what's going on, we don't know who's in charge, we don't know what we're supposed to do. And so you have a lot of frustration on the team number two because the conceptual person is busy getting into new things, doesn't respect the need for closure, um, doesn't uh, recognize the need to clearly communicate the details and the mission. And you have the methodicals with these other needs and you have a lot of frustration on that team. Team number three, uh, we'll flip it around, we'll put the uh, high, highly structured person more judgmental person in charge of a group of conceptuals, uh, that group too becomes very frustrated. Again, the like me syndrome because the methodical boss wants every employee to be methodical and systematic, um, but the employees are more conceptual. They don't finish what they start. They're not good with details. Uh, they're assuming things all over the place and not making things clear. And so the methodical boss gets very frustrated. What the methodical boss will do over time is to micromanage the conceptual employees and the conceptual employees, after being micromanaged for a period of time, will quit. And what will happen, you can see the dashed line on this slide, is the methodical boss will interview people and look for people who are good at structure, uh, who are, who are uh, very structured and organized. And over time, the conceptuals will be replaced by the methodicals. Uh, so then you have team four. And is team four a bad team, methodical manager, methodical um, subordinates? Well, it's not a bad team. It's a, I call it the high performance team. It'll, uh, you know, if you put them going in a certain direction, they'll go in that direction forever and they'll do it very well. Problem is, if you need to change, if you need concepts, if you need intuitive thinking, if you need strategic change, the methodical group will tend to blow past those things and just keep doing what it's been doing forever. So all these teams have problems and you as an as a, um, expert of leadership need to recognize the situation you walk into. Uh, now none of these teams are, you know, exist in purity, right? You have mixes all the time. But these are very important indicators of team dysfunction. Okay, uh, and so I wanted to set the stage because it's important for you uh, to make sure you know what your Myers-Briggs type is um, so that you, as I go through the theories coming up, that you can be able to see where your preferences lie because leadership theory really gets us into different leadership styles and a lot of those leadership styles derive from our core natural tendencies which are inculcated in us when we are children. Uh, if we live and grew up in a highly structured environment 
we tend to prefer highly structured things. If we grew up in an environment where it was sort of kumbaya, sort of in the 1960s, there it was sort of like, uh, you know, everybody do what you want to do, uh, then you might tend to be more on that right-hand side and prefer that kind of an environment. Uh, one last thing is, uh, especially for those of you who score highly judgmental on the minor Briggs, uh, I want to go through a systematic method. And we cannot, when we look at a problem situation, we cannot assume the solution. We cannot go right to solution. We cannot say the problem here is we don't have good leadership. That's a, that, that's, that's a cause of a problem, not a problem. So I want to introduce you to the diagnostic method very briefly. Uh, I want you to uh, always follow this method. It will save you a lot of um, frustration and it will get you noticed and perhaps even promoted at some point down the line. So the diagnostic method goes like this. First, uh, there's an awareness that there's a problem. Then we're looking for the conditions that, that the evidence that the problem exists. And they have to be factual and measurable. So the problem is never bad leadership. Uh, it is never low morale. It is never, um, it is never uh, uh, we don't have policies and procedures. Those are other things. Problems are things like uh, we're making mistakes, uh, we're taking too long to get things done, uh, our costs are too high, our time is too, too we, it takes us to do things, is too long, etc. Now notice about all those, those conditions I just identified, the problem, it, because they're measurable, they're measurable in time and dollars. And so you always start with the conditions, do not start with the causes or the solutions. And so uh, slow down, start your problem discussion with the factual, measurable conditions that you observe. Then for each of those conditions, those, those situations, start to identify the causes. So what's, what's the cause that we're taking too long to get a student graduated, or we're taking too long to process patients, or we're taking too long to do something? Uh, what's the causes of that? And then uh, as you see the obvious causes, then ask yourself what's causing those causes, and, and, and continue to look at causes in a cause and effect way and get yourself to the root cause of the problem. What's the root cause of, the, of all the causes that are creating the conditions that we've identified? And then if you can do that, then you know that for every cause you need a solution. And if, and, and if your solutions fix all the causes, the problem and the conditions will go away. So it's a very important uh, uh, model uh, called the diagnostic model. And this is just a visual that says, start with the conditions, the facts and states, absentees and turnover waste. Um, identify the likely causes. Uh, look at the obvious apparent causes. Dig deeper and find out what the root cause is. Because you'll find leadership is generally not the obvious cause. It, the communication may be the obvious cause. And then leadership may be what's causing communication problems. And then look at the solutions, fix each cause, and then go over to your conditions. And you have your metrics to see if you fix the causes. Okay, I'm going to skip the examples just uh, for time's sake. Um, and I'm going to skip this data collection uh, slide uh, again for sake of time. And we're going to dive right into leadership. Okay, so now I've told you about people because people are really the core of what makes organizations tick. And leadership uh, innately is about people. So different leader, leaders behave in different ways. Uh, they have different styles. Uh, different needs, different situations, uh, leaders just behave differently. Uh, there's no topic more important than leadership uh, because leadership occurs among people, involves the use of influence, and is used to attain organizational goals. Um, so uh, recognizing different leaders behave in different ways, uh, we need to have a definition of leadership. We need to look at differences in leadership and management. We need to get into the theories of leadership. And then we need to uh, really dig down into uh, what uh, they might mean for you. So nature of leadership, the ability to influence people to attain goals. Leadership is reciprocal and occurs on, among people. Uh, it's a people activity distinct from administrative paper shuffling or problem solving. It's dynamic and involves the use of power. And that's an extremely important point. Uh, leadership is different than management. You can be a great manager and a lousy leader. You can be a great leader and a lousy manager. You know, all these things kind of go back and forth. Uh, I want to ask, uh, pose a question I always ask students. I always say, um, real me this. Tell me why I run into people uh, all the time who tell me how bad their leaders are, their supervisors, their managers. And yet I can't find a single manager or a single leader who will admit to me that they're not good at what they do. 
And I, I can't understand that riddle. I can't understand why so many people uh, criticize leadership and so many leaders think they're great leaders. I don't understand that and we need to try to figure out what's going on here. So I recognize that management is about being organized, about shuffling paper, about uh, ordering things on time, it's about setting schedules, it's about all the uh, basic detail kinds of things that an administrator does. But leadership is the ability to effectively harness and, and, and coordinate a group of people to accomplish a mission. And they're very different things. And as the slide says here, uh, management t uh, takes care of where you are and leadership takes you to a new place. Uh, leadership versus manager qualities. A leader uh, is a visionary, is passionate, creative, flexible. Maybe, maybe not. I've seen great leaders who aren't that passionate. Uh, and a leader is innovative, courageous. So this might be a little bit biased. It's shown the anatomy of a leader. Well, where are the leaders tomorrow from the management or cabinet management review? Um, and uh, manager qualities are more about being rational, uh, being a consultant, persistent, problem solving, tough minded, analytical, structured, deliberate. So, uh, Again, if I go back to uh, the uh, personality preferences I was talking about before, do you think that the manager side of this would equate to my, um, uh, to my methodical uh, characteristics or traits? Well, perhaps that's true. Um, and do you think that the leader qualities would equate more to the uh, conceptual side of the personality traits? Well, perhaps that's true, but I'm not totally convinced uh, that that all of us, um, despite our preferen preferential uh, temperamental preferences, that we can't be effective leaders. And so we really need to sort of dig into this and understand this a little better. <clears throat> I mentioned to you before that you know, leaders aren't leaders unless they have followers, right? So uh, we have to have a followership. And uh, when we're talking about followership, we're talking about motivation. And so uh, I wanted to just point out that motivation uh, comes in two, is a two-sided coin. Uh, there are some things that motivate people, uh, and I refer to them as satisfiers. There are things that have a wow factor, like, whoa. Now, you can tell any time that uh, something occurs in your life uh, that has a wow factor, uh, you pay attention, you get motivated, you get a little bit of adrenaline, and then you're sort of paying attention. And then there are things in life that are dissatisfiers that we really take for granted and we don't notice until someone takes them away or they don't work right. And uh, you'll find that uh, you know, dissatisfiers uh, are the case um, you know, with pay and with benefits. We don't motivate people uh, through pay unless we have the ability, which we don't in most organizations, to make major pay increases, right? Um, and so generally pay and benefits and those kind of things, people assume that they'll be there and they only uh, notice them when they're not there versus the things that are uh, like, whoa, this is special, this is different, this is new. Wow. And so I uh, recognize the subordinates are most highly motivated by the things that are satisfiers. They like to have the freedom, the opportunity to participate in decisions, and be encouraged to innovate. They like to have the room to try different approaches to achieve goals and objectives. Now, of course, freedom has to come with some uh, constraints and boundaries, um, but those kinds of things, they, an environment where they feel like they're really bringing what they have to offer to bear on the mission motivates people. Assignments that are intellectually stimulating, promote learning and growth, uh, an opportunity to make a significant contribution, or to be part of something extraordinary that has potential to make a lasting impact. Now, I always think of the uh, mission control people uh, sending uh, missions into outer space to the moon or to Mars, and how motivated and excited they are. Now, you don't know any of their names, but they're highly motivated because they know they're some part of something that's historic. And so the followership is important to understand in order to be an effective leader. Okay, leadership traits. Uh, and the uh, very early discussion of leadership and leadership theory, which occurred uh, well over 100 years ago, really focused on this concept of traits. Uh, and so our very first studies, our first theories about leadership were called trait theories. And so uh, we really tried to say, well, you know, w what traits uh, can we identify in leaders that we know to be effective? And what traits can we identify in leaders we know to not be effective? Uh, and so a lot of the early research focused on leaders who achieved great, a great level of greatness, referred to as the great man approach, or you know, in this day and age, great woman approach. Um, and how can we find out what made them great and find people with the same traits or teach people those traits? And so uh, that was a really uh, big deal. 
And so when we got into traits, uh, we dealt with things like uh, energy and stamina, um, education and mobility, intelligence and ability, personality, uh, achievement, uh, levels, need for achievement, drive to excel, conscientiousness in pursuit of goals, persistence when they ran into problems, and then their social characteristics as well. So there's lots and lots and lots of personality characteristics of leaders uh, that uh, sort of go into understanding uh, what makes a person be an effective leader. Uh, now, some of the uh, major studies uh, occurred in the 1940s called the Ohio State Leadership Studies. And uh, coming out of those studies, uh, they started to boil a lot of the trait theories down into uh, uh, categorizations of leaders. And so they really uh, uh, began, this was the first time in the 1940s, and when we started to see leaders identified as either people-oriented or task-oriented. Um, and so uh, we when and so they called a leader uh, who was uh, very people oriented uh, as being a leader who demonstrates consideration uh, in the sense that they're mindful of the subordinates, they establish mutual trust, they provide open communication, and develop teamwork. And then uh, characteristics of other types of leaders who uh, have are more task oriented and less people oriented as being leaders who uh, are have a preference for initiating structure. They, they want to direct the subordinates, do what I tell you to do, here's what I want you to do, toward goal attainment. Um, they typically give instructions, they, they like to plan, they uh, hold people to deadlines, uh, and they provide explicit schedules of work activities. Here are the tasks, do the tasks. Uh, don't question what I ask you to do, just get it done. And so that was the kind of leader who was characterized as initiating structure. Now again, I know a lot of you are going to say, but can't you be both? And the answer is yes, you can be both, just like I said with the uh, temperament test. You can be uh, a um, more of a um, conceptual person when you're resting, and then when you go to work, you can be very structured and methodical. Now, the problem with being methodical, if, you're, if your inherent nature is to be uh, conceptual, is that it, it takes a lot of energy. It, it's, it's you behaving in a way that's not natural for you, and so it's very difficult to do. And the same thing is true here. Uh, yes, you can do both of these, um, but how many times have you seen leaders that are too far one way or the other? And I, and I could uh, recount case after case where someone is uh, too worried about what people are going to feel about them and other cases where the, uh, the leader was commandant, dictatorial, and you've heard those terms before. And so both of those uh, at the extremes have problems. And so what we really need, of course, are leaders who are able to blend these two in a most effective way. And we'll talk about uh, other studies, Michigan, University of Michigan did uh, Michigan studies, and uh, they were able to uh, basically do the same thing. Uh, and so they came out, and they used different terms. They called it employee-centered leaders and job or task-centered leaders. And so that was the Michigan studies. Uh, a, uh, coming out of those studies um, was um, the very first um, sort of tool for measuring leadership called leadership grid. And it was a two-dimensional leadership uh, grid that measured uh, the, the degree to which you have concern for people over concern for production. And this is what the grid looked like. Um, and you can sort of see by answering a whole series of questions, uh, you can sort of find out what your scores were. And based on the score, you can sort of see which one of these five groupings you might fall into. And so again, a continual type approach. Uh, and so you can sort of see if you have low concern for people and low concern for production, you're not a very good manager. You're a 1-1. One -one. Whereas if you're a 9-9, then you have uh, very high uh, concern for people, very high concern for production. And then you can look at the other uh, cross-cut, 1-9, who's a person who's overly concerned for people, not concerned for production, and so on. So you can sort of see the leadership grid, Blake and Mooton, and a very useful, uh, very useful grid. Uh, then we uh, evolved from there into what we termed contingency approaches of leadership. And so, uh, <coughs> excuse me, this was uh, really kind of a uh, major shift from just sort of category, categorizing or lumping leaders into structure or people. And so uh, first we found uh, uh, Fred Thieler's contingency theory, uh, which we'll talk about. Hershey and Blanchard came up with a theory called situational theory, which is probably what a lot of you do as leaders. And then Evans and House came up with the uh, management by objectives model called path goal theory, where we set goals and we uh, create a path for followers to be successful. So we'll sort of talk about that. 
Um, this is Fred Thieler's uh, classification of situational favorableness. And uh, he said leaders need to know whether they have a relationship or task-oriented style and should diagnose the situation and determine the favorableness of the following three areas. Uh, leader member relations, task structure, and he introduced something new called leader position power. And so you can sort of see, um, you know, along the bottom, uh, he, he identified or labeled eight different situations. Now you think about this, if you have a, um, you know, if you're, you're uh, supervising people on an assembly line, the ability to give uh, those employees a lot of freedom is quite low because the assembly line has to keep moving and the people have to do the task to which they've been assigned. And you think about that versus you think about a group uh, trying to um, conceptualize a new software operating system or something new like that. Uh, you uh, really need to give them a lot more freedom. So he identified a series of situations. Then he talked about uh, what types of leader behaviors tend to work best um, in, in the situation. So this was Fiedler's theory of contingent leadership. Um, just a note, uh, I was attending an academy management conference a number of years ago in Las Vegas, and uh, I, uh, I was sitting in the audience listening to a presentation. And a gentleman came in, an older gentleman sat next to me, and he had a plaque with him. And I looked over at the gentleman, and I noticed uh, that it was a Lifetime Achievement Award to Fred Fiedler. And so sitting next to me at the conference was uh, this gentleman who came up with this theory, a very renowned uh, theoretician on leadership, Fred Fiedler. And so uh, I have to say I was a little starstruck and a little bit uh, um, impressed that I was sitting next to this great man. Um, Hersey, and, Hershey, Hersey and Blanchard's uh, situational um, leadership theory uh, does the same thing uh, about, uh, as I was talking about on the previous slide, uh, they say, you know, the situation dictates the leadership style. And so uh, if you've got uh, people who are at a low readiness level, you need to be more involved. Uh, moderate readiness level uh, of your followers, you need to sell. High readiness level, level, readiness level, you need to participate. And a very high readiness level, you need to let the people do what they do best, delegate. So this is a very useful theory as well. Uh, situational leadership, uh, and I'm not going to get into the details here again due to time, but this comes back to the people behaviors on the y-axis and the task behaviors on the x-axis. And you can sort of see these different quadrants um, show where on, on the previous slide we were talking about delegate, participate, sell, and train, and, and tell. And so you can sort of map those together um, yourself. Path goal theory. Um, okay, path goal theory uh, really was a big deal in the 60s. Uh, it led to a whole uh, kind of evolution in how to do performance appraisals and how to set goals for employees and then how to measure them and hold them accountable to achieving the goals through measurement and stuff. And that's what path goal leadership was all about. Path clarification, uh, rewards identification, measurement feedback, the, the whole process of path goal on leader behaviors. And then again, uh, classification of four leader behaviors. Supportive leadership uh, looks like this. Directive leadership looks like this. Participative leadership looks like this. And achievement-oriented leadership looks like this. And so path, path goal theory was very useful, uh, a very useful theory. Um, in terms of the situational contingencies, you need to know the personal characteristics of group members. Uh, you need to uh, look at the work environment, the degree of task structure needed the nature of the uh, formal authority system in the work group itself. And based on those things, uh, you needed to uh, be able to adapt your leadership style and leadership approach. So this slide kind of repeats some of what we've been saying so far about path goal. Um, Substitute for leadership, um, the, uh, I'm going to skip over this slide just because it's a little more detailed than we need to get into. Uh, I wanted to uh, mention this leadership model because I, um, I did my uh, d doctoral dissertation, and I had a theory that uh, PhD economists, where I worked at the Federal Reserve, um, had a preference for lazy, fair leadership. And so I did a, a lot of research on what lazy, fair leaders do. Um, this is a fairly negative portrait of what lazy, fair leaders do. They don't always need to be exactly as negative as this slide pr predicts. But here's uh, what the theory tells us, that a lazy, fair leader tends to avoid responsibility and action. Well, that's because they're leaving their employees alone. Uh, they make no attempt to satisfy follower needs because there's an assumption that the followers can satisfy their own needs. 
they make no attempt to motivate followers because they assume that the followers are self-motivated. Uh, they tend to delay decisions uh, and try to stay out of the way, maintain minimal involvement with subordinates, uh, you know, because they feel like their subordinates don't need a lot of leadership, and they don't provide feedback and rewards, possibly. Okay, so it's kind of a negative portrait, but recognize there's a style of leadership called lazy affair leaders. Uh, in my doctoral dissertation, my assumption was that uh, PhD economists working at the Federal Reserve and would probably prefer to be left alone because they're PhDs and working on advanced economic problems. Turned out not to be the case, but that was my theory going in, my hypothesis. Um, there's another kind of leader called a transactional leader. This evolved out of the Ohio State Leadership Studies. Um, and so the uh, transactional leader tends to uh, appeal to subordinate self-interest. Uh, they try to motivate people through basic things, wage increases, promotional opportunities, extra time off, or whatever. They, it's sort of like, you know, if you do this for me, I'll reward you in this way. I'll promote you, I'll pay you, I'll uh, give you time off. Uh, transactional leaders create an environment based on democratic authority. They tend to be more bureaucratic. They tend to not want people to uh, go out of chain command. Uh, they tend to uh, want the relationship between leaders and followers to have fixed rules and, and to respect the traditional way of managing subordinates. Uh, they clarify the role and task requirements of subordinates. They initiate structure. They provide appropriate rewards. They display consideration and respect for the subordinates, and they meet the social needs of subordinates. So I ask you, are you a transactional leader? Is this you? Is this the, the preference that you would have? Now, if you're in the military, you're a leader, probably like this. If you're in law enforcement, you're a leader, you probably like this. Uh, if you work in a uh, research and development organization, you may not like this so much. If you work in uh, organizations uh, where um, um, things are not quite so clear and there needs to be less structure, you may not like this. But if a transactional leader comes into an organization that doesn't have transactional type work, that can create problems. So transactional leaders, very important for you to remember this. Next type of leader is called charismatic leader. Charismatic leaders are selected by followers because they believe the leader is extraordinarily gifted. Charismatic leader model has four stages. A leader tends to see an opportunity and formulate a vision. The vision is communicated to the followers who are persuaded that the status quo is no longer acceptable. Through success, personal risk-taking, self-sacrifice, and unconventional behavior, the leader convinces the followers to accept and trust the leader's abilities. And the leader convinces followers that the vision is realistic and achievable. Now, we've known a lot of great charismatic leaders over time, people who are able to, like, get everyone excited and then to make promises and then to lead them in a certain direction. Sometimes uh, charismatic leaders are successful and effective, and sometimes they are not. So transactional leadership, charismatic leadership. We move on from charismatic leadership to some of the um, great examples we'll talk about in a few minutes uh, to transformational leadership. Transformational leadership makes a note that many charismatic leaders, such as entertainers, athletes, and politicians, are not necessarily transformational leaderships. They get by based on their charisma, but not necessarily on their success or their recipe for success. So uh, key factors in, that separate transformational leaders from charismatic leaders. Charismatic leaders sense opportunity, status quo is no longer acceptable, uh, convince the followers to follow, and convince the followers that they can achieve things. Uh, but then we add this uh, concept called individual consideration, where each subordinate uh, get specialized treatment according to their needs and abilities, and this intellectual stimulation element where we teach followers to look at old problems in new ways. And so uh, when, we talk about tra tra when we talk about transformational leadership, we can think of some of the great leaders uh, over time. Uh, one of the famous leaders in India was Mahatma Gandhi, because he was able to convince this large population that British rule was not in the best interest of the people of India. And through nonviolent methods, Gandhi was able to transform the nation into self-rule. Uh, we think the same thing about Martin Luther King. For his, uh, all the great things that he did, uh, he preached nonviolence, and he was able to usher forward the civil rights movement in a way that caused great social change without uh, a, a lot of violence. Uh, we think about Abraham Lincoln. Uh, you know, his goal was... Uh, I will not have this nation torn into two. And he held to it. He convinced people. 
uh, went through some tough times, bitter, bitter fighting, but he held the nation together. John Kennedy said, we're going to put a man on the moon and return, it, sit, return those, those men safely by the end of the 1960s. And we, the nation pulled together, got extremely motivated, and actually accomplished what he set out as his vision. Those are transformational leaders. Heroic leadership, heroic leadership is also talked about in the literature. There's some theories on uh, heroic leadership. It's very similar to transformational leadership. Uh, there are eight principles associated with heroic leadership. They have to maintain absolute integrity. They have to know their stuff, declare their expectations and stick to them, show uncommon commitment, expect positive results, take care of their people, put duty before self, and get out in front. And so Gandhi, I uh, mentioned Lincoln, I mentioned a lot of Civil War generals on both sides were able to uh, get people to follow them uh, in shocking and surprising situations and difficulties and duress. And then the last uh, of the theories is called uh, super leadership. It focuses on growth and self-development abilities and others. Uh, four main goals of a super leader is to develop an environment that promotes a positive attitude, enables employees to set personal goals, encourage observation and commitment among subordinates, uh, encourage group members to support and motivate one another. Some examples, Phil Jackson, who's a famous coach of the LA Lakers. Herb Kelleher was the uh, founder and first CEO of Southwest Airlines. Uh, Jack Welch at General Electric was uh, considered a super leader. And so every once in a while we get some of these leaders who are truly extraordinary, and we have to study and ask ourselves, you know, what are the characteristics that make these people as effective as they are and how can we teach younger leaders who come along um, to, to be as effective? Now, final uh, notes on leadership. Um, the sources of power of leadership are really important. Uh, legitimate power comes from being the boss, right? You have the boss job. Reward power comes from being able to, um, in some way, motivate people. Uh, coercive power is the authority to punish or rec recommend punishment, not a very positive uh, kind of power. Expert power is because you're the most knowledgeable on a subject. And then referent power is the personality characteristics that command the subordinates' respect and admiration so that they wish to emulate the leader. Uh, I'm going to uh, close uh, by telling you a very quick story. Uh, my very first uh, supervisor when I left the military, um, his name was Michael Nieberding. And uh, for many years, uh, he was my boss. And uh, uh, I admired this man. What he would do, uh, I worked in one location. He worked in another. I was sort of by myself. And he would come around and go throughout the building and ask my customers if they were satisfied with what I was doing. And then they all would, would say, yeah, he's doing a great job. But he would disappear. He never came to see me. He just disappeared. And so I just loved working for this man. He was just... Uh, you know, he was inspirational. And then I come to find out uh, a year or two later that he was uh, a captain in the Army in Vietnam, and he sent out this very moving letter that he had lost 12 men in the rice fields in the paddies of Vietnam. And uh, I, I knew instantly that I, too, would have followed this man to the death because he was such an extraordinary leader. Uh, it was just a moving testament to what this man was all about. Now, I will say to you, I've had other leaders where I would not show that kind of devotional loyalty to them. In fact, I've had quite a few of those. And, and, but this one leader, this incredible, charismatic super leader, uh, just had me so motivated that just like the Civil War soldiers, I would have followed them into the, the harshest firefight and laid down my life for these kind of leaders. So that's the power of leadership. That's what leadership can do when it works well. Uh, if you use leadership improperly, if you try to exert force, if you don't know how to handle problem employees, you don't know how to motivate your best employees, you don't know how to hold everyone to the same standard and to expect a great work for a fair pay because as a leader, you're managing a, an employment contract for your subordinates. They should be giving you the amount of work that equates to the amount of pay that they're taking home. And so for you to be a good leader, you really have to uh, focus on uh, being a great leader, understanding the theories that we talked about, being situational, and really causing uh, all of your employees, from the best to the worst, to be uh, performing at their maximum, at their peak level. 
And uh, so I hope uh, this lecture on leadership has been helpful. Um, I hope you reflect on your temperament and preferences. Uh, I hope that you can, at times, um, behave in ways that are not exactly aligned with your temperament so that you can recognize those who are following you and their needs and you can uh, serve as a great leader in the future.